Hello and welcome to English with Mr. D. In today's lesson, I'm going to tell you how to get seven in IELTS speaking part one. Many people have an objective of level seven in the IELTS, whether it's for work, study or immigration purposes. Level seven shows a really good standard that allows you to work or study in an English speaking country. So for lots of you, I know that's what you're aiming for. Let's see how to get that band seven. English with Mr. D. So band seven is your target. Let's see how the IELTS website describes a band seven candidate. A good user, the test taker has operational command of the language, though with occasional inaccuracies, inappropriate usage, and misunderstandings in some situations. They generally handle complex language well and understand detailed reasoning. Does this sound like you? Not too bad, right? You have to be pretty good, but you still have some room for error. You can still make some mistakes. So the speaking section of the test is the same for all candidates, general and academic, and it's split into three parts. Today, let's focus on part one. Here's what the IELTS website says. Part one, the examiner will ask you general questions about yourself and a range of familiar topics, such as home, family, work, studies, and interests. This part lasts between four and five minutes. Part one is nothing to worry about because the questions are all about you. So you can't really give a wrong answer and you don't have to remember anything. They might ask you what you study or where you work who you live with, or about your hometown. It's all stuff that you know the answer to. They're not trying to catch you out or ask you difficult questions. So just have a natural conversation as if you're talking to a person that you just met. Think of part one as a nice opportunity to relax into the exam, to get into a nice rhythm before parts two and three. I know it's a stressful situation, but if you can avoid becoming tense and nervous, you give yourself the best opportunity to demonstrate your skills. Now, don't worry about what the examiner is doing. Students often tell me that they get worried and panic at the beginning of the test because they think the examiner doesn't like them. Well, maybe they hate you, but that won't affect your score. The examiner is only interested in your English. But what's really going on here? The examiner doesn't hate you, they just have a job to do. They have to concentrate on everything you're saying and maybe they're taking notes and look all serious. So don't try and interpret the reactions of the examiner or read their facial expressions. You both have more important things to think about. So what exactly is the examiner listening for? Well, they assess you in these four areas. Fluency and coherence, lexical resource, grammatical range and accuracy, and pronunciation. Let's look at the official band descriptor for level seven in each area of assessment. Fluency and coherence. First point, speaks at length without noticeable effort or loss of coherence. They want to see that you can answer the question in a way that makes sense. Key points here, not too short, not too long, not memorized. Again, think of it as a natural conversation. If the examiner says, tell me about your hometown. My hometown is Paris in France. Too short, we need a bit more detail. By the 12th century, Paris was an important political, religious, economic and cultural centre. In 1163, during the reign of Louis VII, the Bishop of Paris undertook the construction of the Notre Dame Cathedral. Paris grew in population from about 400,000 in 1640 to 650,000 in 1780. It's too long. It's not coherent because I was jumping all over the place with dates and facts. And worst of all, it doesn't sound natural. It sounds memorized like a robot reading from Wikipedia. The IELTS examiners are good at detecting memorized speeches. It doesn't work, so don't do it. Just a nice, natural answer. I'm originally from Paris. I love my hometown because it's an iconic city, recognized worldwide for its art and culture. I absolutely adore the people. They're so kind and welcoming. And there's nothing better than walking along the River Seine on a warm summer's evening. It's so romantic. Done. 
Next question. Don't worry, you'll get another chance to talk. They'll ask you some more questions. But try to gauge the length of the answer based on how you'd have a normal conversation. And look, in point two, they tell you that you can have some hesitation if you can't remember how, how to say something. You can also have some repetition, some repetition, but hopefully not too much. And if you realize that you've made a mistake, you can correct yourself. Great. Finally, to make your speech coherent, use some connectives and discourse markers. Words like and, then, but, so, however, despite. Don't go crazy here, try to keep it natural. Remember that some connectors are great in written English, but sound a little bit unnatural in a conversation, especially in part one, which should be relaxed. Our next area of assessment is called lexical resource. That means vocabulary, the words and expressions that you use. Here is the level seven descriptor. Top of the list here is flexibility to discuss a variety of topics. So the idea here is that they can ask you about a whole range of topics and you have enough vocabulary to talk about anything that they ask you about. Same for the second point, some less common or unusual vocabulary and maybe even some idioms or expressions. So to improve in this area, you need to expose yourself to a range of different topics. If you're targeting a band seven, you're at the level now where you aren't just practicing your English with a grammar book or an English course book. You need to be exposing yourself to real life English. Reading books, newspapers, websites, watching films, documentaries, the news, and listening to talk radio and podcasts, all in English. Think about everything you do in your everyday life. How would you do it in English? Everything from filing a tax return to changing the oil in your car. That's how you collect diverse vocabulary. They ask you about the environment. You know coal-fired power station because you read it in a book. They ask you about jobs. You can talk about zero hours contracts and the informal economy because you heard about it on the news. These topics are more likely to come up in parts two and three, but you get the idea. Now I know what you're thinking. Mr. D, tell me two or three cool idioms that I can use in the test. Okay, well maybe you do have a go-to expression that you like to use, but the problem here is that you don't know what they're going to ask you about. So you might learn over the moon and make ends meet, and you're absolutely determined to use them in the test. Well, when they ask you about your hometown, you end up saying, I'm over the moon to be from Paris. People move there from all over the world to make ends meet. It just sounds weird. You've sacrificed your coherence by trying to show off, trying to impress the examiner. And your expressions didn't really work. They were kind of inappropriate. So no points there. If you don't have time before the exam to develop your vocabulary in the way that we discussed, you're much better to focus on answering the questions the best you can rather than trying to force some, some big words that you aren't familiar with using. The next area you're assessed on is grammar, and it's called grammatical range and accuracy. And that's exactly what they're looking for. A range of complex structures and error-free sentences. But I encourage you to reverse those two points. Focus on the accuracy especially in part one of the speaking. Remember, it's supposed to be natural. So if you're trying to force the future perfect continuous or a mixed conditional where it doesn't belong, it's going to be awkward at best and you risk losing points for inaccuracies or making errors and the fact that it's inappropriate. Now in speaking parts two and three, you do need to ensure that you're using a range of different structures and times but I'll cover that in another video. I'll put the link up here. In part one, just answer the questions in the most natural way that you can. The final area of assessment is pronunciation. Not something that you can do much about the night before the exam. But don't panic, let's just see what they're looking for. The band seven descriptor says, 
shows all the positive features of band 6 and some, but not all, of the positive features of band 8. Thanks IELTS! Okay, so first we need to look at band 6 and make sure we can do everything here. Uses a range of pronunciation features. Pronunciation features are things like word stress. It's comfortable, not comfortable. Connected speech, where do you live, not where do you live. And intonation, whether your word or phrase has a rising or falling intonation. All of that good stuff needs to be happening, but you can't really think about it in the test. Impossible. The main thing that you need to worry about is this point. Can generally be understood throughout. They don't care about your accent. If they can understand what you're saying without too much effort, then it probably means that your pronunciation features are good. You're onto a winner. If you can stay calm and relaxed, you stand a better chance of making your pronunciation clear and natural. If you want to read all of the band descriptors, they're available on the IELTS website. I recommend that you check out the band 6 and the band 8 to see the things that you need to avoid and some of the things that you can strive for. So good luck. I'd love to hear how you get on. So leave me a comment and let me know. If you found the video useful, don't forget to give me a like and also please consider subscribing to English with Mr. D. See you next time.